This feels so much more formal. It is more formal. It is far more formal. So you're gonna keep your shirt on? Depends on how drunk we get. <laughs> hello, everybody, everybody, hello. Welcome to another one of Copy That's uh, podcast episodes where I go to some state that is not Maryland and interview working thriving, successful copywriters, and basically ask them another question. We have another return guest, the one and only Kyle, your boy, Copy Squad Milligan, sitting over here. We are currently in his uh, apartment and co condo in, uh, what is this, Boca Raton, Florida? Yes. And we are going to talk about uh, a number of things today. We're going to talk about uh, the common mistakes that a lot of newbie copywriters make, uh, the problems that a lot of them are running into. Uh, we're going to try to talk about copywriting, like education and YouTube in general, and some of the uh, pros and cons of all of it. We're going to try to save the beef and the drama for later in the podcast and try to like foreground the value. But uh, now that I've introduced the episode, Kyle, is there anything that you'd like to say to everybody to uh, say hello? What's up, Copy Squad? It's your boy, Kyle Milligan. Coming to you with your boy, Sean McIntyre, in Boca Raton, Florida. And today, we're going to talk about copy stuff. I have promised Kyle that I'm going to keep my shirt on. If you go to youtube.com slash copy that and then go to the live tab and go through, there's actually a very long um, sort of podcast stream that he and I did together where we got too drunk. And I ended up shirtless and might have said a few offensive things. He might have been a complete saint the entire time. Honestly, I don't remember. Anyone who's hung out with you more than a couple hours, they see that you can, you can go out of control. You have, you said rat f at top one. Just for context, Kyle and I were both at a lock-in at a mansion in Reunion, Florida with 19 of the best copywriters on the planet. I don't know why they invited me, but basically they asked a bunch of people about like the effect of AI in on copywriting the copywriting space and I was talk I gave my typical spiel which again is available on the channel if you want to go see it uh, but because I have like I was the only one there that has experience actually coding for machine learning alg algorithms and I basically said that like there's a problem that nobody's talking about right now with AI which is that AI is tr now starting to train on other AI writing which is going to lead to, and these are, these are my exact words, an ineluctable degradation of the actual large language model. So what does that mean? That basically means that anybody who's relying on GPT-4 with like for their tools that they've modified using API calls to get all these VSL AI stuff, you know, a lot of people work on like AI tools that use GPT-4. So any thing that's connected to that that has that degrading model is going to be rat -fucked. And he, that's what he, I said. He, he said absolutely rat -fucked. and the whole table lost their minds yes <laughs> that this this guy says indeluctable kellogg cereal <laughs> and then then continues down this rabbit hole and all he's really saying is if it's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy it ends up dog shit. and then <laughs> instead he said indeluctable darlula <laughs> and, <laughs> and at the end of it he says the words rat -fucked very loud as i actually had it in my head after the last one i was like you know what i'm gonna show up as a professional to this we're gonna talk about copy value and i'm gonna deliver lessons from the secret vault of copy experience and the chambers of the black lagoon and i started with rat fuck. well i mean we ended with rat fuck. that was the last thing that i said that, that basically ended the the meeting all right noah cut everything <laughs> just start over yeah we could find a home for the ai stuff i i I, th I think that we should start then with the secrets from the black copy lagoon mm -hmm. and i wanted to ask you a very particular question that has been on my mind relatively recently which is why is so much newbie copywriting so f***ing bad i think that is how it has always been mm -hmm. i mean like you're asking like why is someone not good at something not doing a good job copy is a craft just like, what was it? Like, uh, you said dribbling a basketball. Mm -hmm. It's like learning to play guitar. Like, you don't read a book your way to being a great guitarist. You practice your way to a great guitarist. And so when it comes to copy, we all do it. The, you pick the thing that's too scary to do. Pick anything that you want to do that that's feels larger than life, that you're a little bit timid to approach. Anything that involves rejection. So if you're a freelancer, you um, don't have the benefit and I always tell, 
I'm a big fan of going in house, getting a job, getting a mentor, and getting the reps. And you don't have to face that rejection at the same scale as a freelancer because it's actually that rejection. Like you're already going to fail. I mean, no offense. You're going to fail as a copywriter. Your first couple things you write aren't going to be your best. And so the reason that newbie copy is not good is because they put hurdles in their own way, whether they know it or not. Like being a freelancer is a hurdle because now you also have to learn how to prospect and you have to also will yourself and have the motivation or the discipline if you don't have motivation to prospect. And I've been like, I constantly, I do the same thing. I'm, I, I know this feeling well because to this point, I have definitely leaned on my black book. I've leaned on my current Rolodex. It has been a cushy, safe fall for me anytime I need work to just sort of call up someone I haven't talked to in just too long. It's been like six months. They probably need copy now. Let me, let me just circle back. And uh, I have sort of made it a point in my head to begin like, you know, I need to branch out of here. I met a guy at Top One running an options trading YouTube program where he's just a, he's a coach and he wants to get in this subscription model. He wants to get in this newsletter slash like uh, he's got a discord server that people pay for access to. And so through top one, we connected uh, stock trading pro is the name of the company and it's not an Agora. It doesn't have the infrastructure, it doesn't have everything built out already in the same way. He's learning how the model works and I can, I can bring that knowledge to him and I noticed, like, you know, this is something I did at Wealth Press. If I could tell a story, like, I don't know if I'm supposed to monologue on a podcast or not, but I could tell. A... No, th this is a conversation. Feel free to go, like, this is it for the rest of the evening. So, all right, podcast. So, Wealth Press, the, the way this story goes was Wealth Press had about a $2 million a year. Braddock joined. Mm -hmm. And he took them, I think they were doing around one. He took them to two. And then I came on <clears throat> and then like my, they were having a pretty good year that year with Braddock and some of his promos. And they had this program called the V-Bounce Strategy. And the V-Bounce Strategy was about this, uh, so this, there's a support line, 200 day moving average. And the price would sort of fall to the support line. And the idea is it probably is gonna bounce off the support line, right? And it's gonna cause this little V-shaped curvature to the price. And so they were selling this trading program, like a little course for $7. And, uh, and that might not be 100%, it might be $19. I can't remember exactly, but it was like $7, right? So I came in, I saw like, okay, what are the assets that we have to work with? Like, uh, <clears throat> what, are, you know, what are some things that we could build off of without having to do a lot of extra work? I find the V-Bounce thing, they gave me like three or four programs. They're like, hey, we could turn this into maybe a service or something. And I was like, all right, can we do more trades with this V-Bounce strategy? Just make that a service. Like, we're going to teach you how to find these V-Bounce trades. And they're like, yeah. So I was like, okay, cool. So let's take this $7 course, turn it into a weekly service where we find you a trade a week using this strategy. I'm going to create a promo. Remember, this is a $2 million company, $7 product. And I take this V-Bounce idea and I say, okay, how about this? We have to come up with a big idea. I need a metaphor. I, I consider a big idea just a metaphor, basically. So let's back up a little bit, because I feel like we've jumped way ahead into very advanced stuff. So this is like level five of research, which, what are the first four? I don't even know. <laughs> um, for context, we are talking about a financial publishing company that publishes information, lessons, courses about stocks, crypto, etc. And the way that that is typically marketed is with what are called long-form direct response sales letters. And the way that these work is that they really spell out and really prove like how a particular system works and why you should be interested in a particular system enough to buy it. And what Kyle does and what I do when I have the time is we will write these sales letters. They are often 6,000 to 10,000 words long. And yes, people do read them. And what they do is they articulate an emotionally compelling argument, often called the big idea, that 
really grabs attention and makes it so that you feel like you have to purchase this thing if you want to make money with this particular strategy. And so I'm going to kick it back to you so that you can finish telling the story. Yeah, so like, all right, take, take this story then, and this is how you can make your clients money if they're in the financial publishing space or maybe any other space. So what I did, I take the $7 course, I go through it, and I figure out, you know, okay, the V bounce thing, seven-day moving average, price movement, all that shit. And I'm like, all right, here, we need a metaphor for people that'll be very gripping, compelling, and explains this. So I come up with this idea, on-the-clock stocks. And when a stock has a certain trigger that puts it on their radar to monitor, like when they have to monitor it for the V-bounce, once the stock hits that trigger, I forget the trigger is so long ago, it's on the clock. And what we're doing is the delta, which would be the distance between the price and the moving average. So this line and the price. I said that was a clock, a timer. Mm -hmm. And we're counting down. And when it hits zero, you're going to invest. And it's going to do that bounce. So the stocks are on the clock. And when they hit zero, you invest. And then they bounce back. Took that $7, and again, it might be $19, $20. It wasn't very much. Took that $7 course, turned it into a weekly service. We sold that for $2,500, I think. $2,500 for a membership. $800,000. So take a $2 million company, and in one sales letter, $800,000. Nearly a 50% increase. Yeah. And what I did just there, right there, was called dimensionalization, by the way. A reframe. Yeah. We were talking about prospecting and m an idea of bringing this knowledge of like what we did in the big giant machine that was Agora and bringing that to smaller pubs. Wealth Press had... Uh, an $11 million year that year, 800 of that came from that one sales letter and that one go. And then the next year we did 50. Like they tasted that success of what could happen with the big promo. And the next thing you know, we're just like every week trying to do another, it was like crazy. But that came from this talk about like nowadays and prospecting and the fear of it and all this, bringing it all full circle. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna tie it together. But like, I still call upon people who know me from those days or people who I worked with there or I worked or knew my name around Agora. And I don't like to prospect, even as an agency owner. But I know the power of taking these ideas and concepts to a, if I could find a publisher who's doing like a million bucks and I could give them an $800,000 launch, like, holy Toledo, like the impact that I can make for that business very quickly. Uh, I know that, I could do that, and yet, I don't want to prospect. I don't want to call or cold call. I don't want to cold email or go through the rigmarole of convincing them or giving the value that, that I know what I'm doing and building all that. And yeah. I, I've, I've gone through it with some people, but uh, all this to say, like, I know even, it never, that struggle doesn't, like, go away. Because when I talk to someone who doesn't know me, I'm just as good as the next freelancer. I can say I've made all this money, which definitely would help my case. I can say, you know, I've done all these big launches or I've worked for these big names. But there's a, there's a dark side to that. I was talking to a group not too long ago, and they're like, Agora Financial, why does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's that company got sued out the ass by the FTC. He's like, you did that? And I'm like, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Agora was a big company with many copywriters. And so, I mean, even then when I use my credibility, it almost like bites me on the ass if I say like, yeah, I worked with a, a MarketWise business or I worked with an Agora Inc. business. Uh, there's always some sort of objection or hurdle to overcome. And even I'm like, God, I don't want to deal with this shit. So I know the pain to a degree. Well, I mean, it seems like, you know, a lot of the struggles that I encounter with freelancers, you know, people who watch Copy That, people who watch your show um, on YouTube slash your chest. Oh, do oh. a plug. Copy Squad. <laughs> I feel like there is a lot of insecurity for people. And I think it helps people to understand that that doesn't, necessarily go away even for people who've seen multi-million dollar success because i think that there is something that most people don't understand which is they assume that once the money starts rolling in they'll just naturally have the confidence and what i'm trying to say is that that isn't the case 
very frequently. You need to have the confidence first, or at least fake it till you make it. And then in that process, work on the competence. Mm. And that's just going to breed more confidence. The, the whole concept there about it's just imposter syndrome doesn't go away because it just actually levels up. Then it becomes like, yeah, you had that hit, but could you do it twice? Sure, I did it twice. Yeah, but have you done it in the last week? Yeah, but could you do it with this guru? Yeah, but could you do it with this team? Yeah, and it's just like, no matter what you do, you're always having to prove yourself. You're, and this was a very common expression at Agora. It's like, you're only as good as your last hit or your next hit. I don't even remember. But it's basically the, the premise is, all right, you, you made us $10 jillion. Now what are you good for? Like, <laughs> it's like every day. Yeah. So I was actually, I was at an event with Evaldo. So Evaldo Albuquerque, he wrote a great book called The 16 Word Sales Letter. It has more than 16 words. Direct response. We're always lying. Um, <laughs> no comment. No comment. Plead the fifth. Yeah. Um, he mentored both of us on different promos. And Evaldo and I, we were both on a recruiting mission. You know, I was a publisher at the time, and he was a copy chief, and we were both looking for copywriters to work for our businesses. And at one point, we were drinking, and I asked Evaldo, what keeps you, like, he was making, like, Two million, three million dollars a year. Like sometimes he was making two million, three million dollars per check. You know, he he was the back end master for two, three years running. Mm -hmm. And I asked him what kept him motivated, and he said, "Fear." Honestly, terrified. I'm terrified that I can't do it anymore. And. Listen, by any metric, he might be and might have been the greatest copywriter to have lived. He was still terrified. And so one of the things that I think I try to talk about, that I would love to talk about more with you, is the mental game that goes into this. I love the mental game. Because a lot of people, when they first start this, they either are deeply not confident and you know paralyzed to even take the first step into anything or they're so drastically overconfident that it actually negatively affects them now i think i have i want to start with the overconfident i have like immediately faces that appeared in my head when you said that mm -hmm. what do you mean by overconfidence negatively affecting you uh, do you know the Dunning-Kruger effect? Yes. So the Dunning-Kruger effect is basically where you're... This feels like you, you could you could host like a Nickelodeon show or like a podcast where like they like have an educational segment, like Dunning-Kruger effect, and it comes on as like a Crayola crayon book, and they're like <laughs> the little kids skipping through. This kid thinks it can pick 10 daisies, but this little bastard can only pick two daisies. This little shit. How many <laughs> bastards are left? <laughs> Eight. The answer... Is eight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so tell them Dunning Kruger, Frick. Professor yeah. Warkenstoffer. <laughs> <laughs> it's von Kloipenstock. <laughs> <laughs> that video was so fun to make, man. I can't even begin to. Like, it drained me. Like, getting all those pieces together was a pain and a half. You know what you know what I actually thought about the other day? What pains me about that video? Hmm. Dude, besides, like, just like my muscle spasms because I was cringed so hard. The, the thing that pains me about it is I just don't think it'll get the views it deserves. I just don't think because you're doing the opposite of what works. You're not making big flashy promises. You're not saying one month to 10,000. Like, no, it's just not going to get the views it deserves. For the effort and energy and creativity that went into it, I just, I just don't see that one going viral. And I, that wasn't the point, you know. I know, but it hurts me. So I feel like we're getting far away from Dunning Kruger and Dunning Kruger, comments, but correct. Pro, we, pro, pro, we'll go a little Robert meta. Uh, von von Kloipenstock. Mm -hmm. Doc, it's Doctor von Kloipenstock. <laughs> 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 yeah, you say you cringe, but you laugh. Um, I, I, yeah, I laugh to relieve the tension. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the goal. I've been marketing for a long time. I've been doing this for a long time. 
And one of the th easiest ways to make money in this business is to just sort of like do what everybody else is doing, but like one step removed. Like, so Mark Ford in Ready, Fire, Aim, he talks about this concept called one step removed, where basically you look at like somebody else's offer or somebody else's business or somebody else's copy, and you basically rip it off, but you do one major thing differently. Mm. Either it's a different idea or a different technical indicator or a different like bonus set, whatever. And then you run with it. And you know that it's going to work pretty well because it's working for everybody else. That's one way you can go. And what I've learned over the course of my career is that you can also go the exact opposite direction. You can look at what everybody is doing and then march in the exact opposite direction and go, I'm not going to do that. Because here's the thing. Any offer polarizes. Any piece of copy, any approach, it always polarizes people. You're always going to have people that are drawn to an offer and people that are disqualified or repelled by it. And what I discovered early on in the days of Copy That is that we were getting better qualified people from the videos and the streams where we legit said like, you might not make a million dollars from being a copywriter. You probably won't be successful. Statistically. Exactly. Mm, probably. Like the word probably is is an actual statistical measurement. You probably won't. Yeah, but you're saying there's a chance. No, so mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the dumb and dumber. Um, and so here's the thing. I've seen a lot of you know offers. what's funny is that's the, like you make a lot of references. Like I was like, of course I know that. Dumb and dumber, duh. <laughs> Every other reference you've ever made, I'm like, what? <laughs> anyway, just to put a pin in that particular thread, um, you know, I, I'm not doing those kinds of videos because I think that they're going to do great. I'm doing it because I think that there's a neglected portion of the market that I want to speak to mm -hmm. and that I think would benefit from what we have to offer. You yeah. know, I, I often make a joke on um, the Discord, the copy that Discord, which you can see in the description below, um, which is that my audience, my target demographic is not young men who want to get into copywriting and make a lot of money to like, I don't know, either get all the women or what they really want, which is the approval of their fathers. Um, my target market, my target demographic. What if is, what they want is the approval of women? <laughs> that's just a substitute for the approval of their fathers. Um, <laughs> we, that's going to be a thread. We're not going to go down it. But um, I often joke that my target demographic is a 30-year-old, 31-year-old single mom with two kids who maybe, like, loves reading, loves writing, but, like, doesn't know how to make money from home. Mm. That's my target demo. Like, that's the person that I want to speak to. That's the person where, like, I look at that and I want to help that person. I don't really want to help the person that, like, just wants money and clout. So anyway, just to circle back to what I was saying before, the Dunning-Kruger phenomenon is when you are so ignorant of what it takes to be competent that you presume that you are competent. Mm -hmm. And really it has to do with the fact that uh, you know the skills necessary to recognize competence are the same skills as actually being competent. And what you realize as you get more competent is you realize how not competent you are, mm -hmm. which tends to put a ding in your confidence. Mm -hmm. And so earlier when I was referring to overconfidence and overconfident people, what I find are a number of people who feel very entitled and feel very eager to get their first client. Like, oh, I just heard about copies writing. I, I, how, what is the best way to do outreach? I'll just start emailing 50,000 people right now. And it, it pains me to my soul to see these people. Um, because I'm just like, slow your roll, build some competence and the confidence is going to follow. Mm -hmm. And that's my opinion. So you seem to have very strong opinions about overconfidence and they might be different from mine. I think my very strong opinions are about the entitlement that you referred to. Because mm. we had, I had a little outburst on our last conversation about this when I was like, it's about credibility. And I think we split that little clip. And I think that ended up on my YouTube channel. Copy that. 
No, I'm Cubby Squad. <laughs> he plugged my show. I plugged his show. I'm so plug crazy over here. I love so, it. So, Copy Squad. Anyway, um, no, yeah, I think that's the clip that we put on my channel, Copy Squad. And uh, I, I remember, like, watching, and I was like, geez, this dude is riled up. Like, the, I, it does drive me nuts. I think it really drives people nuts, like, it's, it, you know the black belt who's watching the white belt be like, when all right, am I a black belt yet? Am I a black belt yet? Give mm. me a black belt. And it's like, dude, I've been doing this for like decades and I haven't even been in copy for decades. Ooh, we talked about this earlier. Like copy is, you know, guitar, it's a craft, it's a practice. Well, what I said exactly was like, it doesn't matter if you understand the physics of acoustics. It doesn't matter how much music theory, you know, if mm -hmm. you've never picked up a violin, you're going to suck at the violin. Right. And so you have to practice your way to it. So even though, what I has a deficit in time, like years in the game, I made up in reps. And I was mentioning earlier about the Wealth Press story, like we were doing like a promotion, like a launch a week. And like I got in a crash course of reps, like trying to turn around a whole sales argument with a fresh idea. And like every week we had a whole, we had like a dedicated video team. Like all these publishers usually do have one, but like we had just an overworked, like, uh, video services agency that was like just constantly filming promos for us. We had an outside ad agency that was constantly just trying to spin up new YouTube ads for us and campaigns and just like we were just always firing. And so it's really easy to get frustrated with entitled people who have not written literally anything. And they have this. And it's not that you can't get $10,000. You can but per month or ever. Yeah, you could you could stumble into you could definitely get a ten thousand dollar job. It can definitely happen. One hundred percent possible. Per month is difficult. And also, like, can you keep that client? Are you good enough that after one month of giving you that much money, maybe if it's two five thousand dollars or or three or four three thousand dollar clients, are you actually gonna be able to keep up? Are you actually gonna provide them? Are they gonna see the return on the investment in you? So it's very easy to get that initial pop, get that one client, and then be like, yes, you can make $10,000 in your first week of copy. Because if you <laughs> prospect hard enough, you will find somebody who will be at their wits end with this problem that you say you can solve, and they'll pay you, and then they'll be like, damn it. And then it reflects badly on all of us in the industry uh, who are copywriters as, as our as our term of like how we identify our occupation and they associate that word with the the bad experience they had. And so I don't know. My my beef is with the entitlement. Like the 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 zero not expecting the reps and the work and the failure and the, the cuts and the scars and all that. Yeah. I think that I mean there's a difference between people who've been in this business for a while and like are not trying to maximize or optimize their copywriting education grueness like you mentioned earlier the you know what we're doing is not going to get very many views the views it deserves quote unquote uh, because it's not doing what's actually scaling on YouTube um, that notion of like this copywriting thing it's so much work and the people that have done this business for long enough wear that amount of work that they had to do to get there as a badge of honor and pride. And what I've noticed, and this is just the thing that I've noticed, a lot of people that are very successful copywriting gurus right now have done this for like a year and then switched to doing the copywriting YouTube thing full time. And so they didn't put in the reps. They, you know... If you have a key and you test every single possible lock that you can, as long as you are testing more locks than anybody else, you're eventually going to find a door that opens to you. And that has allowed a lot of people with these platforms to sort of stumble into some modicum of success. And they've just sort of parlayed that into a huge following that has allowed them to become full-time gurus, as opposed to like you and me who like show up and work for a living. You're not you're not wrong in a lot of ways. Uh, I don't know. Like part of me's, part of me's like I don't. I try not to let that like become a thing that I focus or think about. Like it just if they're like their success. 
doesn't, and I know it's going to sound contrary to probably some of the things that I've said, but like the sort of way I look at it is like their success at that doesn't take away from my success or my status. And so I try to just be like, they're doing their thing. If it, if it were someone who comes to me and say like, who should I follow? Like, I, like, are they doing what you want to be doing? Are they landing the jobs that you want to land is a good question to ask. Also, like, something that I've really noticed is, like, look at, so, the Copy Legends thing. Mm -hmm. Do they have any stamps? So, has, has, has their work ever been stamped by someone bigger than them? Like, a, a big achievement for me was one of my former writers, Rodney Graviter, took the beats of a sales letter, which is the formula I taught him, and he presented it in Germany to a bunch of people. John Ford was in the audience. His book, Great Leads, is in that stack, right? John Ford writes a newsletter about the beats of a sales letter and credits me and Rodney because he was so dazzled by the concept of the beats of a sales letter. I put that right up there with Todd Brown and other people celebrating Nesby, new, easy, safe, and big. When these concepts that I created get applauded by giants, when I'm invited to things like Copy Legends, like those sorts of things are credibility stamps. The, 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 the promos that I can talk about, the successes that I've had in the industry, those are credibility stamps. I've been stamped. I've been stamped to death. The gold record that hangs on my wall uh, behind when I do my YouTube, it's a stamp. Yeah. Does your guru have any stamps, I guess, is a question you should ask. Um, but then again, like, if he helps you get your first client, I'm not helping people do that. So if that's where you got to go, like if I, I, could, I could maybe pitch a fit. I could get mad about it if I was actually in that pool. So you were talking about your target audience is the single mom who's trying to make a couple extra bucks and is not, not quite aware of copy. My audience is actually targeted more at the 30-year-old male who is in copy and wants an edge. I'm talking to the people who are in, I'm, I thought I was, but it's a very small pool. Mm -hmm. But I started out talking to the people who were in the Agoras, in the Market Wises, in these big publishing houses that wanted a better edge to beat the other copywriters. Because in our work, as soon as you write something and it gets published and you make any money at all, there's a, there's a line out the door of people trying to beat that control immediately. They want to beat that and take your money. Mm -hmm. And so I thought when I originally started making content, and I kind of am still doing the same thing. I'm not talking. I'm trying not to talk to the beginners. No offense. But I th I'm trying to talk to people who are on their way to intermediate. And now I'm just, I was going to do that because I thought I would sell because this was back when Agora was like a big giant. It was the 800-pound gorilla. I thought that because of my connections, I would just sell and be paid to do trainings for copy teams. I would just like take my concepts. I'd teach their teams. I thought I would be a B2B guy. Agora promptly crumbled and split and fractured, and all my contacts sort of went different ways, and I had my YouTube channel, and things just didn't work out that way. Now I have like my own agency, and I use those things those trainings to train people to write for me. So my target audience, and this is why I don't think, you know, much of my content will go viral. And I want to come back to this viral thing because I think it's really cool. Um, because I'm just straight up talking about copy technique. And it's so esoteric. Mm -hmm. Like nobody knows what I'm talking about half the time. That's abstract too. Like if you, if you don't know, you can't know. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah, you know, if you've never sat down and tried to write a promo, so much of my content's gonna fly over your head. Um, but that's like that's the content I wanted to make. Like if you look at my very first video, and the second and third and fourth and fifth, what I did is I sat down to break down a long form financial sales letter line by line, and the exercise. First off, I was already a year in the game, and I already written a, several controls that had generated you know, either millions of dollars or tens of thousands of uh, front-end names. I'm not bragging. What I'm saying is I first put in the reps and I had success before I ever launched a YouTube channel. I told myself I'm not allowed to launch a YouTube channel for at least a year. I should not be on YouTube talking about something 
for at least a year. That was the deal I made with myself. I had to at least be in the game for a year before I went on a YouTube thingy. So when I did it, I wasn't even teaching. I wasn't even teaching. I was just breaking down the sales letter. And I was sort of um, narrating my experience. Uh, so I have a, a junior that I was like, hey, would you like to do a YouTube video for the copy squad? A junior on my team. And he said, yeah, I could teach about poor man's intrigue, which is like a really nuanced concept. And I'm actually almost thinking about just burying that concept altogether because it's too bleh. But I was like, no, no, I don't want you to teach anybody anything. I was like, I want you to, you know, you're working on my team. You're writing copy. I want you just to share your takeaways. Share your ahas. Don't come in here trying to teach anybody anything. Like, like you're not there yet. Just share your aha moments. And so when I started my YouTube channel, that's what I was doing. Was just, and again, it's, it's like I couldn't believe that anybody was watching my videos because it was so niche. And like I didn't think anyone would, and I was doing them live. And one day I had like 12 people on a live. I was like, what the hell's happening? <laughs> I didn't know there were 12 people in the world that cared about this. <laughs> so then it just became like a thing of like the train just didn't, I just kept going. I just kept making videos and stuff like that. But, um, and I keep, I keep getting on these weird tangents. Uh, I do want to circle back to the viral thing. Is there anything that... How far off topic did I just get? Pretty far. What I, were we talking about? I don't, I, we've gone through so many like branching paths. We're in basically a Vargas story. YouTube. All right, check this out. Here's something I do want to say. So let's say a guru goes on there. He's a professional guru at being guru. Like He hasn't actually done any work. Something that we've talked about and I'm becoming increasingly aware of is YouTube is the new direct response copy. If you look at the sophistication, you look at people like Mr. Beast, that he has, I want to say boil it down to a science, but then, you know, it's almost like there's this, like this inverted, like you first boil it down to a system and a science, and then once you have that mastered, it becomes art. And I feel like that's like a guy like Mr. Beast, you know, he has it to a science, but then he's turned it into art. And like the guys succeeding at the YouTube game, the more I pay attention even if the formula is, you know, uh, so I think where you would disagree with it is the formula is not serving people's best interests. They're manipulating the formula in order for their own personal gain, possibly to the detriment of others because they don't have the stamps, because they don't have the credibility, because they don't have the experience to share the knowledge. Yeah, and I can speak to that in a moment. Yeah, but I do think that there's a um, something that I've never taken my YouTube channel seriously. I barely take my email list seriously. Um, and guess because I'm, I'm doing, most of my income comes from doing projects and writing copy. God, uh, is what a shocking concept. I know, right? So, um, but I have started like thinking about it. Like, it, there's, if I took that skill set and I use it to write scripts, it would just take so much time. Like, so then you think about that and it's like, why aren't I doing it? The reason I'm not doing it is because it takes a lot of time and energy and effort. It takes a lot of work. And so, on one hand, I'm, like, I'm conflicted about it. Like, on one hand, well, obviously, this takes a lot of energy and work and effort. Like, you don't get this kind of success too lazily unless you're doing, like, reaction content where you're not actually making any content whatsoever, which is, like, the laziest form. Oh, my God. Did we manage to sneak an SS Sniper Wolf reference into this <laughs> podcast? Wait, let's go into <laughs> doxing and YouTube deplatforming. <laughs> but you had something to say about maybe credibility or something. Well, I mean, in the video with, you know, Marketer Hell and Dr. Von Kloipenstock and all that, I ended with an observation that I actually made in a YouTube short when I was working out in the gym. And I just kind of had a thought and I recorded a short based on an observation that I had made, which is that, like, there really are only three reasons to try to make a copywriting platform on Instagram or YouTube. And one of them is simply to take people's money. Like you, you just found the easy money and you just want to take it. I feel like a lot of gurus are like that. I, I find that detestable um, because I got into this mainly to, like help people and have fun, which I think is the second reason that people do this. Can it, I? It is actually fun. I, want, I should I wait for you to get all three out? And Let then... me get all three out. All right. Um, like I'm sure you can tell from watching some of Copy That's videos that we have a lot of fun doing this. Mm -hmm. And then the third reason that I found that a lot of people do this is to have a recruitment funnel that you want people to buy the courses. 
to basically prove themselves as like good writers and like get attention from you so that you can hire them for your agency. Oh. And of course there's going to be overlap between the three of those. Like, you know, the Alex and Lindsay and Rod and I wouldn't be able to have as much fun as we do if we weren't able to like make money from selling, you know, the stuff, the Patreon subscription or the CCA uh, available in the description down below. Um, <laughs> I just made a plug. I'm bad at those. Um, it's, it's, it's only bad if you have to laugh at it afterwards. I, if you could do it smoothly. No, I, I'm not smooth at all, and I'm never watch, going to try to pretend yeah. to be. Well, you just got to watch a Copy Squad video, because I'm really good at plugging. Like, I don't know if you've heard of, like, when I plug Take Their Money, I just let everyone know, hey, man, if you want to know how to write the words that really make you rich, you want to check out kylewriter.com forward slash book. And right. it's just, like, really smooth like that. You never even notice. I never pause. I never say, just check out Copy Squad. Here's the thing. I could do that, but I also think that my audience tends to appreciate the self-effacing, like, nervous like and by the way we also like sell stuff like that's sort of like slightly neurotic self-referential mm -hmm. self-effacing thing like i think that that is like the polar opposite of like what's really scaling right now and i do think that there's an underserved market of people that like tend to glom on to those types of personalities a little bit more i know you're trying to be contrarian i was trying to be super meta when i was doing all my plugs while you were what were we talking about plugs but I want to push back a little bit, this idea. So something that I, I I'm, I'm almost, I don't want to be like a, a, a sympathetic person on this, but like when I look at the way people view the financial publishing industry, they would categorize it as number one, as the number one reason that you said earlier, like to take people's money. There are people that look at the financial publishing industry and they say, this is just the easiest way to take people's money. Promise them they can get rich. Promise them they can retire. And we've... You know, apart, organizations that we've worked with have published those things. I've published <laughs> something quite similar to those claims. And oftentimes we justify it. Well, this is honestly, like, if you don't publish this, no one's going to buy it. Like, they just won't buy it. And so we say that's our justification. The ends justify the means. And so part of me has a sympathetic angle for the gurus who are coaching gurus that, like, they came in with good intentions they found the magic key. They're like, this is the only way people will watch my videos and I can get my message out there. So here's how I, this is the game that's got to be played. And so they get sucked into that wormhole, just like all the big financial publishers have to. And then they looked at like these evil corporations that are taking everyone's money. It depends. Like I do firmly believe that you can have a big business without making insane promises i think market wise is that business they don't yeah they they do insanity in their own other ways no yeah for sure but like you know i i'm not saying you can't be extreme in some way i mean good god look <laughs> at how often i get shirtless on our channel um but no like <laughs> 10 views <laughs> <laughs> I do feel that it is necessary in order to get people's attention to be extreme in some way. But I think that is, it is the mark of an amateur to have to rely on big promises all of the time. The best, the easiest, the fastest. I think that really good, big, new, easy, safe, you know, only, etc. I think those are all extremely valuable. But it's once you turn those into superlatives that you start, I think, crossing the line into um, something I find reprehensible. When you say superlatives, are you just saying, like, adding EST? Like, what do you mean when you say turn them into yeah, superlatives? Yeah, grammatically, like, EST. The like, biggest, fastest. Unless you can back it up with something, I find that using <clears throat> that tends to be mm, a problem for me. So one of the things that I teach my guys, it's funny you say... Because I just think it's lazy. I, I think it's lazy, is is my opinion. It's so funny you say that, though, because I tell my, my own writers, so maybe I'm in this, maybe I'm guilty of this and when we're writing projects, but I don't care that you had, like, I think what I tell them is, like, no one, no one gives a shit if the F1 racer had, like, an 18-minute lap time or whatever. No one cares. They only care if the next best racer had a 22-minute lap time. Like, holy shit. 
And so in that regard, I tell them copy is comparative. You can't give me any information without stacking it next to another piece of information that paints it in a very uh, favorable light. And so the superlative thing, like, uh, I don't know how you write copy without it. I don't know how you write copy without making it comparative and making it better than, like, you know, even... But you just did it. You didn't use the superlative. You used the other term that I'm currently forgetting. You, better than. Mm -hmm. Not best. I like best. I do think that it's more powerful. It's definitely... It's definitely more powerful. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is, if it's the best, then the proof has to be there. And for me, the problem that I have, the thing that I think is lazy, is people who claim something is the best or claim something is the easiest, claim something is the fastest, without having anything, without having done the legwork to back it up. And I think that a lot of newbie and amateur copywriters make that mistake. They'll say it, but they won't actually take the time to justify it. The people that justify it, Christ, if you can prove that this is the best way to trade the stock market, Christ Almighty, shout it from the rooftops. But... If you can't, shut the fuck up. I don't know, because now we're getting to murky waters, in my totally, opinion. Totally, absolutely. Because what you're describing to me is the winter section. So I have a section called winter, which is, uh, I, I borrowed from Oren Kloff. He has it in his book, Flip the Script. He talks about winter is coming, is a section of his pitch deck. And I was like, that's a really good section. And that's where you just sell them out of everything. Like, if you don't do this and do it now. Everything else is going to be defunct. Everything else is going to fail you. Everything else is just psh. And so I make it a point in our copy to find ways to do... We have it a winter section. A winter section. Like if you don't do this, uh, you're in for a lot of pain. Like It's not going to go good for you. And so when you're writing copy, you learn like... You learn this in like statistics class if you went to college, that... Numbers and data are just numbers and data, and they can tell any story you want them to tell. And that's kind of like this magnificent beauty and superpower of copy. That If you give me, that's my job, is you bring me, you bring me a 30-something, you know, uh, single guy trader, you know, living a fairly modest lifestyle with a mortgage, and he trades options. And my job is to paint him a millionaire and his trading system is the best, the fastest, the biggest. Like, that's I feel like that is my responsibility is to paint in the most favorable way possible. And I've, I've minted a lot of money figuring out that, that yeah, message. Of course. So it's like, I can't sit here and be like, don't do that. I just... I couldn't do that. I'd be an absolute hypocrite if I were to tell people that wasn't cool. I'm not saying that that's not cool. Because here's the thing. When you write the winter section, mm -hmm. do you just say it? Or do you actually provide some proof for it? But I feel like you can... That's what I'm saying about the stats thing. Is I could prove anything, brother. I even had this thought for for YouTube. I was like, you know it would be a fun way... To, I mean, some, if someone wants to steal it, I guess they could. Because it's going to take a lot of work. I thought a fun way to sort of do a segment on Copy Squad would be that I would simply prove any audacious claim. Because with copy, you can. I would take something just either ridiculous or I would pick some sort of like current event that's very polarizing and then I would just absolutely prove the shit out of it for 10 minutes that you know this is the correct uh, stance. And then the very next video... I would completely reverse course and I would prove the shit out of the other side just to show the power of copy. And I thought that'd be a really dem a de demonstrable, 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 uh, uh, a way to show the power and skill of the craft mm -hmm. in my own unique way. So maybe I shouldn't have announced it like cut that Noah. Maybe I should. <laughs> no, no, no. That's uh, coming to you soon on what is, what is the channel? Copy squad. There you go. This idea I dropped a year ago and then we just never did it. I think that that's powerful, but I think you should do it in one video. Mm. I think you should do it about something related to copywriting or copywriting education, 
like how to become a copywriter. Like the one thing you need is this. And then in the same video, no. The one th- yeah. the one thing you need is this other thing. Yeah, I could do and, that. And then like sell against the alternative in both sides. I remember one time I was wa- I had I was walking around Austin, Texas. Yeah. And it was very walkable, so I was walking a lot. And I have these socks that don't quite cover my heels. So I started to develop a little blister on the back of my ankle. And someone said, like, <laughs> Kyle, quick, write a sales letter about <laughs> Ankle blisters, and he was just joking. He didn't know he didn't know anything about copywriting, and uh, so I just started spitting off like exactly the template of copy. I was like, "What if I told you that there is one way to absolutely ruin a trip to Austin, Texas that'll never you'll never forget, and you'll always like blah blah blah." <laughs> and I was like, "Daria says like this ruined my trip, and Steve said this was the most painful, excruciating experience." And I like went through CNBC the whole CNBC reports that. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, the I blisters did that. blisters are the number one cause of a ruined vacation. Exactly, I did that. I did that. And the guy was just like, holy shit. And I was just like, yeah, you can do this for any topic. Like, it's it's a formula. It's a it's a way. That's why I call it, in my book, Take Their Money, at copysquad.net forward slash book, I explain the secret language of sales. And essentially, it it really is. You have to, when you execute enough reps, it becomes... It is just another, like when someone goes from English to Spanish and you're not a native speaker, you're like, wow. But like, you could just pick up and start talking copy as if you're in a sales letter. It's a different language all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And so I can recognize when someone's really bad at copy and I can hear it in their accent. They have like a copy accent, like a foreign accent. Like, yeah. And whenever I catch your copy sounds like copy. Yes. That's what I say. I actually, what I say is you're writing copy. And so I'm like, what the, f-? like, I had it happen today. I had it happen today, and I've, I haven't had to get stern with, like, I haven't gotten, like, frustrated with some of my writers in a long time. But I was, like, reading, and I was like, what the hell are you doing? You're completely writing copy here. Like, this is just bullshit. Like, this is just fucking, like, it's just copy. And I can smell it, and I can see it, and the reader will sense the inauthenticity of it, the fact that it's not backed by research. Like, it's just... Actually, one of the first things that Mark Ford ever said, one of the first pieces of feedback I've got. <laughs> out of the womb? Was, yes. It like, just came out of the womb. And Mark Ford said, your copy sounds like copy. You f- stop that shit. Um, now I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's a register of copy. And it's like, uh, you know, there's the sales language. And then there's this slightly, I think, better register where it's, more about speaking to somebody as though they were a friend. David Deutsch talks about this a lot. Like, you're not writing copy for somebody you're trying to, like, bilk out of their money. You're talking to your grandma. You're talking to your grandfather. You, wanna, you want your copy to be something that you can show to your family members and be proud of. Mm. And if you can do that, you're writing copy well. And, I'm, and I say that hesitantly because I'm sure there are some people out there listening that are going to hear that and be like, Oh, I, you know, this is the best option trading system. Grandpa, you need to start like buying bull call spreads on Nvidia right now. Nvidia. <laughs> They're just going to destroy their family's <laughs> fortune. I I can tell that I'm already getting drunk because I'm sort of starting to lose the thread. Maybe I shouldn't drink for these or maybe I should drink more. So I actually uh appreciate the the format of we're not going to have a format. And at some point, if you pay close enough attention, we'll say something that you can use in your life or in your career, in your writing. How was I? Where was I with Mark, though? I, that was where I split off. Talking about girls. Uh, oh, mental game. Yeah. Yeah. So we got to the mental game. The mental game has always been so important for me because uh, I'm, I am the prototypical copywriting archetype male who's like, I, where do I belong? I don't f- fit in at this f- corporate. I did well in school. I got a master's degree. I passed the CPA exams. That's tough. Yeah, it's like the second hardest exam to pass behind like the Series 7. I excelled in all these areas. I was in a band. I played guitar, and I was pretty good at that. And like, it just felt like no matter where I went, and I told on the time that you and I hung out, I was like, I f- failed my way into this. Like... My whole life was like, uh, 
I don't know the fuck I'm doing. I don't know the fuck I belong. I don't know who my fucking people are. What's my tribe? So the mental game for me has been, uh, when you brought that up, I was immediately like, I love that topic because it's something that, especially in the last year or two, that I've decided to attack head on. It was a thing that I didn't even know I was wrestling with for like 31 years. Yeah. And then it was like, wait a minute. This struggle exists uh, almost exclusively within me. And so like I, I, uh, and now I'm, I'm doing it now. Like where I started talking, like, I like to talk about valuable people and talk to Mark and then we talk about girls and there's a mental game and then there's a, so, uh, I, I, I really, uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to make like a grandiose point here. Maybe you can save me, but like, <laughs> well, I mean, if I, I, if I could try to interpret the thread, which is that one of the things that you have been striving to communicate, especially with the platform that you've built, is that there is so much more to copywriting than merely writing words on the page or getting prospects or things like that. It's partially a lifestyle. It's partially a mindset. It's partially a way that you comport yourself in society. You, as a copywriter, are going to be different. And I often tell the story where you and I and Manny, uh, a member of his agency, um, we were having steak dinner. And I just remember you asking me a very specific question. I'm going to remember it verbatim. Sean, do you ever have trouble talking to normies? And I remember that so clearly because I had the feeling of like, oh, he's at that stage. <laughs> <laughs> because there's a period of time where as a copywriter, you're going to try to communicate with other people in your life, like family, for example, what you do or what you're interested in doing. And you won't be able to do it. You, you'll be able to sell millions of dollars worth of supplements or financial newsletters or like courses on ESP, whatever you're trying to sell. And you'll find that you won't be able to explain what it is you do to anybody that you love. And that is a huge mind F. I'm not drunk enough to swear, even though I've been swearing this entire time. It's a huge mind f for people that get into this and they don't realize that they have to cross that bridge and they have to literally relearn how to communicate with people in society because the life of a copywriter is so dramatically different. The mindset you have to have to succeed in this is so dramatically different from almost any other industry, especially any other type of writing that you do. I mean, I know that you personally can speak to that as well. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I have experience of this on, on my couch. Uh, I was sitting with a past girlfriend and Manny, who would just made a cameo in your last story uh manny texted me i think it might have been saturday at 10 p.m and the girl i was dating like ran hr so you gotta <laughs> talk about fucking polar opposites right so manny texts me like 10 p.m on saturday and he's like hey man you got time to talk and you know we're, we're in the middle of a project or something like that and so he's got a draft or something he needs me to review or a section that he needs some feedback on and so we're sitting there, probably like having a nice glass of wine, probably watching TV, and I probably Uber East a bunch of Chinese food, and we're just sitting there being fat and sassy, and my phone goes, Oh, mm -hmm. so Tuesday was coming? Yeah, you know. So, no, it was Saturday. So anyway, so <laughs> oh, well, I do. Tuesday was coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's always coming. Bring so, your coat. Yeah, so I get the text, and we're doing our thing, and I'm like, hey, give me like, honestly, probably 30 minutes. And she was like, 30 minutes? And I was like, I just, I got to handle this. And she was like, you guys just don't have boundaries. And like, you know, she's HR. No. She's H, she's literally HR. And she's like, this, this is just, oh my God. And I was like, you don't understand. Like, <laughs> what you're talking about right now. 
Like it, it, it's a different life. Like it's we we don't operate on the same. Like to her, this is something that. Uh, oh, here I go. I'm going down on the rabbit hole. And now yeah. I'm now I'm cognizant when I go down rabbit holes. I just don't like closed minded people. So for instance, when we sit here and we talk about coaches coaching coaches on coaching, and I'm like, well, you know, let me try to see it. From not coaches coaching coaches on coaching. It's coaches coaching coaches who coach coaches who coach coaches how to coach coaches. <clears throat> right. I mean, so I'm I'm I try and I'll say this, I've gotten better about it in the last year or two. I try not to be closed minded. I try to be open minded. What I think ultimately call it open minded, I try to be less judgmental mm-hmm. because I've been under the microscope more as I become more public. Uh, my work gets ridiculed more as I put myself out there as a freelancer or like as someone, like I mentioned, like the one guy like tried to blame me for Agora Financial's fall. And then subsequently, uh, Wealth Press got a letter as well. I mean, like all of the companies got a letter. Yeah. So um, I was like, he associated me with all that. And then, uh, you know, just things, I guess this is part of growing up, getting older, is like, I just can't. I don't do judgment anymore. I don't. I don't tolerate it as well as I used to, uh, and so that was a rabbit hole. I knew I was getting in, and I paused for it because I knew it was coming. I knew I just had to get it off my chest. And that you can you can almost see it in my development. If you look at me today versus like the f- whatever three or four years ago, I started the YouTube channel. Like even the way I present myself on camera, like I'm a, I'm trying a lot harder to be more authentic. And I'm trying to be authentic is a very oxymoronic thing, but I'm saying like I try. You're I notice, more confident in yourself. Yeah, I, in I, your I, presentation. I, I I noticed that I was putting on a front for the camera and for being like this copy guy and all this stuff, and I didn't I didn't like that I wasn't like I was like on camera I'm this guy, and I'd meet people at events and in public, and I'd be swearing and drinking and and just being like me. <laughs> And I was like, these people don't actually know who I am, and I feel like I'm, I'm like, I'm like bait and switching them when they finally meet me. Pull me HR, off close-minded people. Yeah. So that was the thing. Like, it's cool if that's how rules work in her world. I think what bugs me is when I, when I encounter people who refuse to accept, and I think this might be like a exclusively like white American problem. If I dare say. <laughs> Not touching that. Not touching that. <laughs> but like. <laughs> Moving from like North Carolina to Florida was such a culture shock for me because I grew up in the Bible Belt, and that was the first crack in like the the whole thing of like this is what's right and this is what's wrong and and just like this is what's good and everything else is bad and shameful and like yeah. sort of like pre- uh, breaking out of all of that. And again, this goes back to that thing about like this is all part of that mental game mm-hmm. where you're shedding the basically call it shame and because what shame really is is like it's a it's a list of shoulds you should be making this much money you should be achieving this much success you should be this many subscribers or views on youtube like you should you should be better than that guy over there you you should be stronger or in better shape you should get up at 4 a.m. every day with the sun and go for a 6 mile run and then bench press a fire truck and then body slam a dire sore <laughs> and then you need to eat applesauce for breakfast and only applesauce and if you have any like don't don't eat any sugars but applesauce is okay but only do carnivore and then it's just like it's like all this crap and it's and it was crazy cuz like uh it's like whenever you just like release all those chains and just kind of do your own thing and just like, I trust the process and I'm just going to go with the flow and you like figure yeah. like it's, it's uh that's the mental game that we're, we, and, and, and everything I just said is probably crazy woo woo too much whiskey talk, but maybe some piece of that resonated with somebody because it's like, they're like, Hey, that, that feels familiar. I, I think that that probably feels familiar to a lot of people. I'm going to tie the thread a little bit for everybody watching right now. You're a good partner for that. Like you're good for taking all this. I'm just going to, here's what I do. I spit all the words in the page and then you're like the copy editor that comes and makes sense of it all. God, I can't imagine a worse insult. Is it? (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm going to be the brains behind the operation. Sean, you clean it up. <laughs> no, no. It's like, I'm joking. I say, I'm joking. I'm I joking. say complete nonsense. <laughs> I, look, I, no, what I'm saying is I'm the copywriter. You're the copy chief. Okay. I just gave you that. Oh, uh, so thank you. Thank you for changing the frame there. I, um, I was just going to run with the joke because I thought it was funny. That was very good. Um, what I was going to say was that a lot of people, when they first get started copywriting, are looking for what are the best pieces of copy to learn from? What are the best things that I should do? The, I frequently see this, and this is one of the reasons why I have such an aversion to the word the best. I also have an aversion to the word should or ought. Mm. And you know, what should I do in this case? What should I do? What ought I to do? What, what is the best thing to do in this case? And I frequently tell people, like, I don't answer best or should questions. Hmm. And the reason for that is because, one, I don't fucking know you. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know this, the nuances of your circumstances. Like, I would need to know so much in order to actually answer a best or should question. So, like, also, shut up and go away. Um, but the second reason for that is because, I mean... I have a background. One of my degrees is in philosophy, and I, <laughs> I have a background. Just quote that for Sean. Put that shit on the wall. I have I a have background. background. <laughs> I'm gonna put that in the background. It's gonna be very meta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can see it. Like in your, I can see it in your office. Yeah. I have a background. I have and, a background. And like that, that cr you know that old Microsoft Word cursive, like we do signature? I was thinking like um, the crochet, you know, the needle point, <laughs> like a, a grandma As, would make. But you have to quote yourself, dash Sean McIntyre. Oh, yeah, Sean <laughs> uh, something McIntyre. I need like some funny like in-between name. You could do Dr. Van Klimpenskoff. Yeah, Sean A.K.A. Dr. Van G Von Kleinenstock. I got pretty close that time. That time. That Van Kleinenstock. Now you just need to pronounce ineluctable correctly. Ineluctable. <laughs> <laughs> so to sort of tie the thread to back together, um, what Kyle was essentially saying was that shoulds are really difficult to answer because. Every individual is different and has a different experience and needs to find their own path. And one of the things that's common in copywriting is that there's no singular path into this industry or into success. There's no blueprint you can follow. There's no step-by-step -step guide. There's ways to gain confidence with these kinds of guides and competence as well, but it's impossible to actually become successful following these guides because every single path is different and no path is actually replicable. Would you agree with that? I would agree that no path is replicable. I think that there are steps and the steps are take reps. Am I close enough to the mic? I yeah, feel like course. that <clears throat> end of day goes right back full circle. It's a practice, it's a craft, it requires repetitions. And that is the, that's the tough work. I mean, it's, I, and I want to talk about without plugging it, but like, so inside of like the Copy Squad Discord, we have just a channel just for the daily practice. And if you need me to come into the channel and pat you on the f back for doing the daily practice, most of them don't. Like the, the, the dudes in there and ladies, who are uh, just doing it every day and posting every day, they're gonna move ahead. That's like just it's like its own it, reward. It's like math. Yeah, it's just like the it's like one plus one plus one plus one, while other people are sitting at just one. And the the channel, like yeah, it's just a space for you to do it and honor that the daily practice is something you should be doing. And even if you don't post, the seeing the channel light up. Like that, you know, everyone gets a post and it goes bright white or whatever. Mm -hmm. Should be, it should remind you, even even me, because, you know, I don't post my daily practice in the daily practice channel. But you can bet on any given day, I've probably reviewed two promos and I've probably had 
some sort of meeting or call about the YouTube channel. Like that's just like standard operating procedure for my day. And it's kind of annoying because I'd like to do more prospecting and other things outside of that. And I, and that fills a whole day. So it's like, um, and I maybe it'd be good for them to hear this from me. Like, but I'm doing the daily practice. I'm having a takeaway every Tuesday. We do a sales letter breakdown or submission review call at 6 p.m. every Tuesday. And so I have, I've only missed, I think, uh, and maybe Tyler would know better. I think I've missed one, maybe two of those calls in like four years on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I've, I just don't miss it. And uh, that's like, that's because I know uh, if I'm not in the practice, if I'm not practicing the language, I will lose it. And I, I talk about this so much right now, even though I'm not really, like, <clears throat> if you want, <laughs> I'm going to tell you a copy concept right now. The reason I'm spending so much time saying this about the daily practice over and over and over is because anytime you want to emphasize something, anytime you want to make a bigger impact with an idea, all you have to do is double the word count around it. So if there's something that I think is particularly valuable or particularly important, I can simply make it more important by uh, developing and enhancing the space it occupies on a page in word count. And I can do that in this conversation. I cannot stress enough. Like it's not, it doesn't do the daily practice justice to just say, I can't stress it enough. I have to dedicate more words that it is stressed. Does that make sense? It does. But also I think you should tell people what the daily practice is. <clears throat> so I got the daily practice from Joe Schrieffer. And let me go ahead and pause right there. I do, I do my best to always give credit mm -hmm. to when I borrow ideas, when I learn concepts, and almost everything I know came from somebody else. So the daily practice is this concept that I got from Joe Schrieffer, publisher. He was publisher of Agora Financial, and he taught us to every day to get better at copy was to read a piece of copy, write a piece of copy, come up with an idea every day. And I have to, like, I have to go into one more step of depth for this because everyone always asks, like, what does that mean? For read a piece of copy, it literally does, there's two things you need to actually read the copy. But you can't read it as a passive passenger to reading the copy like a consumer. You have to read it as a person who's analyzing what's happening. You need to analyze a piece of copy. Then when it comes to writing a piece of copy... It just don't even matter. Write about a page. Write about a page. It could be for two emails. It could be for a page of a sales letter, a section of a sales letter, a section of a web page. Write one piece of copy a day to, just to get in the, just so you can revisit the language. And then the third thing seems to trip everybody up. Come up with an idea a day. This trips everybody up mm -hmm. because they're thinking, whoa, they're, they, I can't come up with all that many ideas. Oh my God. You can and you do. So for instance, when I'm, re when I'm reading copy, there's a special color I use on my PDF markups is this dark royal blue. The dark royal blue is uh, signals to me, like this is a concept I want to borrow. This is a concept I want to use in my letter. I like this idea, I like this angle, I like this approach, I like this technique. So if I ever use the blue pen, like, ooh, I like that. That's an idea. Like, I like that, I could use that. I like this subject line, I'm gonna borrow that. I like that subject line format, I like this I like the way they set up the problem here. That's really unique. I like this chart. Well, I've never seen a chart like this, or I never thought about a chart this simple. Those are ideas. It's so small. Like anytime you think, ooh, I like that, like just be aware. Just like, I like that. That's an idea. And so just every day, analyze, read a piece of copy. And when I say write a piece of copy, it doesn't mean just hand copy someone else's work. It means you need to create some original content, some original copy. And then your idea is any takeaway that you had that day. And the idea could have come from the reading. The idea could have come from the writing. But you should have some sort of takeaway on your day. And that's the daily practice. It's the most important thing to getting good at copy. I still do that. I still look at copy every day. I, I've, for the past <clears throat> year, looked at more short form than anything else. Um, so because that's what I need to focus on and learn how to do very well. 
But for example, an idea that I wrote down today, it doesn't even have to be a copy angle or a thing from a piece of copy that you read. Uh, I wrote down an idea for today for a possible product. Uh, you know, I was changing a diaper and it was just a, it was a catastrophe. It was, <laughs> there was just poop everywhere. It was, it was green and it was greasy. And I was just like, <laughs> you know, wait. <laughs> it was one of those things where it's like, I, I would have rather, instead of like trying to wipe it up, just take him into the shower and just like spray him oh, off. No. And I was like, what if they're like, cause you know how there's like that there's a pressure washer for babies. Is that basically what you're about to, that? So right. you, you drop a baby into like one you of those drop a baby. Yeah, exactly. Shake it up first. Get it good and shook up. <laughs> then just submerge it in a pool. No. So like, you know, those rings where you can put a baby in and it's like, <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. 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 And so basically you do that, but you put like some sort of like, like plastic seal around the baby and there's like a rotating wash that goes around and gently scrubs and washes the poop off of the baby without you having to wipe it. The, the baby butt jacuzzi? Basically. Mm. I want one of those for me. I want one of those for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, like I had that idea while just living my daily life. And that's yeah. actually where most of my ideas come from. The best ideas that have made me the most money actually came usually from the combination of two ideas from things that I've written down in the past. So we started this off with a discussion of why newbies suck so much and why they have so much difficulty. And we talked a little bit about Dunning-Kruger. We talked a little bit about the difference between copywriters who start with no confidence versus overconfidence. And so I wanted to end with sort of a discussion with you because I actually did this with Daniel Throssell relatively recently mm -hmm. where I asked him, you, what advice would you give to newbies who are trying to get started, who okay. are trying to learn this? And he was basically like, I'm not answering that question because I don't serve newbies. Hmm. He was like, what you just said, mm -hmm. I would prefer to talk to people that are more intermediates that want an edge. Yeah, That's his whole business model too. He's not interested in trying to reach beginners or trying to reach newbies. Um, that's my business model. And so I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give two newbies in particular. What I try to do is like uh, pull the curtain back on the the internal mental like guru behind the behind the the the, the, the wizard of oz veil or whatever. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And let them know that like uh, their their experience is a human experience. And that a guru was just a human and anything like they just had a different set of circumstances and maybe a couple different other opportunities. And uh, I, I try to like through my not just talking about copy technique and stuff like that, because I talk about that on the YouTube channel all the time. It's like all I talk about and it's why I don't go viral is all I'm talking about is copy technique. But the mindset and the mentality and the ability to like be cool with yourself, uh, sh shed the shame and the shoulds. Focus on the process and trust in that process that you will get better with time and that uh, the fruits come with that repetitive engagement with the language and the craft. And then I hope that whenever you listen to me speak, if you listen to me talk enough in enough different settings, maybe it, it starts to sink in. This guy kind of just repeats himself a lot because there's when I when I had Mark Ford on my podcast he said this story about jujitsu. He was asking his black belt, like basically, how do I get to black belt or something like that? He said he had all these questions for his, his teacher and his teacher said, there's a million questions. There's only one answer training. And so I almost answer your question about beginners. There's a million questions and there's only one answer practice. And so if it's, if you're in the freelancer, there's a wrinkle prospecting like, Otherwise, if you have a gig, if you have a job, if you're working for a copy chief, then all you got to do is focus on bettering yourself with practice of the craft. Definitely, you know, consume what you, what you need to. Don't just shotgun everything that's copywriting. If you need to write an abandoned cart series, see if you can find an expert at abandoned carts. If you need to figure out how to re-engage your list, see if you can find an email marketing like Savant, who can teach you how to re-engage dead leads or dead contacts on your list. 
But otherwise, focus on just sharpening your craft, reading a piece of copy, writing a piece of copy, coming up with an idea a day. The rest of it's a mental game of, of doing the least. So my, my, if I had to give one piece of information, do the least. It's like my big sort of, it's, it's you know, I don't think I invented this, but it's that that's like my main uh, driver and focus and, and teaching tool is like you probably are trying to add more stuff so that you can find success. And the problem is you're probably just doing all sorts of dumb shit and you need to remove a bunch of dumb shit and do just a couple little things that actually stack up over time to success. And that would kind of be my advice for newbies is get out of your own way. A lot of times you, you've tied your shoelaces and knots trying to do all this crazy shit. And it's like if you just stopped tying your shoelaces and knots, you'd walk just fine. So a lot of it is getting out of your own way. Do the daily practice. Just plain out practice. And if you are a freelancer, well, then you've got to put yourself out there. And I, there's a million and one courses in Copy Squad, we have little master classes on prospecting from a couple different people. And, and, you know, the principles always sort of come back to the same things, which is like, hey, I looked at your business. Like, first off, I looked at your business. I looked at your website, I looked at your product, something like that. I noticed this. I actually help people do that. Would you be interested in a conversation? Sign off. And if you have some credibility, say, I've already worked with XYZ. That's it. It's like a three-line thing. And just do that. And it might take a little bit of time. So even me, when I'm prospecting, I feel like I'm doing nothing. All right, so here's one more piece of information. When you do copy, when you do the copies, I, Joe taught us, uh, and he got it from Abraham Lincoln. Uh, give me five hours to chop down a tree. No, give me six hours. Five hours to chop down a tree and spend the first four sharpening the axe. Something like that. It's one, five or six. I'll spend the first four hours sharpening the axe, meaning you're not swinging. You're not doing anything. So when you're doing a project, you're just writing a sales letter, you'll feel like I, wrote, I didn't do anything for a month. I just researched. Well, that's so that in the next three weeks, all your research is laid out, your outline, all your, 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 paint, your points that you're going to make and your proof is already laid out. You found it. Now writing is kind of taking care of itself. When you're prospecting, it's going to feel like that too. You're going to spend all this time finding people that fit your niche, people that you think you can help. You're going to be building a list of contacts. And then when you're ready and you have like at least like 20 people to contact or something, uh, then you start reaching out. And then you're like, and then next thing you know, you're like, oh, no, 20 was almost too many because I landed uh, 10 meetings and six of them actually showed up to the meeting and three of them said, yes, now I'm booked. Like, that's how it works. So uh, it get out of your own way. Quit con consuming, 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 consuming. Do the least. Do the few things that work. And it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or an intermediate. Those, that's the pain. There's a, there's a rap lyric that I think was Bad and Evil with Eminem. The, the lyric basically is like, do what you did to get there and don't stop. Like, do what you did to get there and don't stop. And that lyric was, he was talking about just focus on the music, and I think, this is my interpretation, just focus on the music, write songs, keep rapping. That's what got you here. And so it's like the same thing in copy. Like, whether you're a beginner or you're, let's say, at quote, quote, my level, which I'm just a beginner with probably a little bit. Like, at this, like at this moment in time, if we freeze frame, me... I am a person who in the past had all these sorts of things go my way. But I'm, I'm still walking up to the plate just like a professional baseball player. I'm still swinging at the same pitches. And if I strike out six, seven times in a row, <laughs> I'm not so cool anymore. So it was like if I stop doing what got me here, if I stop practicing in the batting cage, then I'm a loser again. Then I'm a nobody. So it's like... That is the big takeaway. Like, do what, you, do what you did to get it and don't stop. So I would say that's my, my whole spiel for what beginner copywriters and even as they in advance into intermediate, uh, my advice for them. I think that's exceptionally good advice. One of the things that you said, touched on, is actually something that we touched on in 
a previous copy of that video about cold emailing, which is we basically implied like there are a ton of people who think that you just need to blast out Instagram DMs. You need to just blast out 50,000 emails to people. And talking to you and talking to Nabil, it's more about the quality of your pitch, of your cold email. Like if you reach out to a person and it seems like you didn't even look at their website at all, what on earth makes you think you're entitled to this job or a response or anything? And I, I think about a um, cold email that I once reviewed for somebody. And the first line, and I kid you not, was, I see that you, on LinkedIn, that you went to such and such university. Keep killing it out there. <laughs> like, that was the personalization line. <laughs> and I asked, like, why did you do this? And they said, an AI scraped their page and chose that as the personalization. I said, mm. that's really, really dumb, and you shouldn't do that. And he's, he disagreed with me. <laughs> I think to this day that person still has not landed a single client. I, I will go on the record and agree with you in that one. Oh, for once. Yeah. I <laughs> Most of the time, it's just, I'll agree with you to a point. <laughs> you went to a university. Kill, keep killing it out there. No, so legit, for the video that we did on cold emailing, um, the skit that we did, I actually wrote as the first uh, email. Uh, so for the skit for this video, we try in all of our skits to have like some sort of like subtle, like subconscious message embedded it within it. It probably goes over most people's heads, but you know, such is life. Um, but the first line of that uh, had to do with my business partner, Lindsay's hat, which she had a brunette hat on. And so What's my a first brunette hat. So it's a, it's a hat and it just says brunette on it. Okay. And so my first line of this like, really deadpan cold email that I literally pulled from a template that I think came from Hustlers University. <laughs> um, like the first line was like, like, Hey, I see that you are, I see from your hat that you're a brunette. Keep killing it up. <laughs> oh, that's such a burn. <laughs> oh, and <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I'm very proud of that skit, but it, really it, what it comes down to with cold email is, the whole point of a cold email is to prove that you could potentially help somebody. And most cold emails don't even bother to do that. I want to expand on that if I can. Please. So like now we're actually having a good podcast where people can learn some shit. Um, so Everything before this was just hot garbage. It was. It was terrible. It was, it was like a, we needed to get drunk enough to... Where my, I got too tired to like be rambunctious anymore. So um, the idea of a cold email is to, you said uh, something, I don't remember the verb you chose, that you can help them. What was it that you said there? Um, show. Okay, show that you can help them, right? Yeah. That's something that, like, how do I put this? Like, it's, it's, like a, it's like a weird epiphany in that it goes back to the do the least thing. Like, all you're trying to do is that like all you're trying to do is get them just interested enough like by saying again so we had a guy in the copy squad basically be like hey i asked this guy uh if i could write emails for his newsletter and the guy responded i don't have a newsletter okay so there's a little bit of a bump right so the guy said so the, the, the copy squad member says, should I write his newsletter for him? And I was like, bro. <laughs> and so my analogy back to him, I was like, imagine this. Imagine you and I are hanging out mm -hmm. or I meet you somewhere and I say, hey, man, what's up? And you say, what's up? And you say, uh, you say, hey, you know, my name's blah, blah, blah. What do you do? And I say, oh, I sell office furniture. Do you need a new desk? And you say to me, no, 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 I don't have an office. And then I go, oh, no problem. 
You don't have, you don't have an office. What if I build an office for you? <laughs> what if I come to your house because you don't have a desk and I build an office on the back of your house so that you have a reason to need a desk now? <laughs> and it's like, that's how absurd it was. It was like, your offer is your offer. And all you want to say is say, hey, this is what I do. First off, you know what you do, hopefully. And you find somebody who makes sense and you say, hey, I was checking out. So, uh, you know, I was uh, if you write um, supplement offers or, you know, supplements, tough business. Like I, they, that, they, 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 people who start supplement companies are basically copywriters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they already know, like they aren't like health and fitness gurus. They're like, I, I know that I want to sell a bajillion dollars worth of something and supplements is blah, blah. So find someone who's like selling, they're trying to actually help people. Let's say meditations, okay? Something like Mind Valley at a lower level. And it's like, hey, I was checking out your pro your product and I actually um, loved, which I, I love this product here, but I think I could actually boost your sales. I, I bet you I could sell you a couple thousand dollars of this product pretty easily with just a few emails. Would you be interested in talking about that? You could, and again, if you have done it before, say, I already did it for a couple other people in this other mindfulness or spiritual space. Would you be interested in talking? That's the whole email. Yeah. And then, like, they... <laughs> if they answer, I don't actually sell spiritual products, well, then you have a bad fit. <laughs> like, I actually don't sell meditation. So you, you would have had to have done some sort of research first yeah. and said, hey... You sell this product. I can actually help you. I noticed that there, there's probably a couple things that I could do to help you sell more because I've done it before. I feel like one way to, I'm yes anding you All right. with that particular pitch, which is if you do enough research and you follow that business closely enough, you will know what in their catalog of products they are or are not selling as much. Hey, I noticed that you haven't been selling your brain boost magnesium supplement very often mm -hmm. in your emails. And I wondered if it was because the sales page that exists for it isn't converting very well. Mm -hmm. Well, I happen to have experience or at least some knowledge of what we could do to improve or boost conversions on that page. Mm -hmm. I've included a sample headline. I've included the sample beginning of a lead. Would you like me to keep going on with it? And maybe see if I can help at all. Right. And right there, I'm going to yes and you. It, someone watching, especially in your uh, tribe, because you're targeting newbies specifically, they probably don't have a big portfolio or experience. They say, but what if I don't have experience? Change Sean's words from I have experience to I have ideas. Period. I have ideas on how I could help you. Would you like to talk about my ideas? And then you can even say, and I got this from a guy named Jordan Platten, on YouTube, he says, uh, end, the, end the email with, uh, would you like to chat about it? No obligations. We don't have to buy anything. And you can even use my ideas if you don't hire me. So they're coming on for ideas. They're coming, they're going to talk to you for ideas. Now you, now again, what I was trying to say just a minute ago when Sean said, you're just trying to show them that you can help them. And I was like, oh my God, it's so simple. But it comes back to this term, and I, I hate this term, value, delivering value. I hate that too. I hate that term because it's so non-prescriptive. It doesn't teach you at all what to do or how to behave or how to actually deliver the value. Yeah, people would be like, thanks for the value, bro. Yeah. I, just, I, I hate that term because <laughs> I can't. When I say deliver value, that's like, then you're just left like, how do I deliver value? So. Yeah. But like uh, value, because value is always subjective. Like what what Sean values and what I value, even though we're best of friends and we're sitting right here and we're doing all this together, he still probably values completely different things than me. And so that's just like, how do you determine what value is? So you can do your best by understanding a business wants to sell more of its products. It would love possibly, probably ideas on how to do that. So if you can bring that to the table, I mean, that's a start. If you're willing to do it for free, that's even better. And I think that's why Alex Harmozzi's, I'm pretty sure this started with Alex Harmozzi. Like, 
you know, you'll do this, 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 or, or we'll get you this result, 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 or you won't pay. I'm pretty sure all that stuff started with Alex Hermosi's uh, $100 million offers book. That, like, proliferation of the we'll do this, 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 or you won't pay offer. But, yeah, so, I mean, just make them an offer they can't refuse. Even in your initial cold outreach, make them an offer they can't refuse. I've got ideas on how to sell this specific product better. You can use my ideas, and you don't need to pay me, but would you like to have a conversation about it? Now you can get them on a call and work from there. I think people overthink almost everything that they do at the beginning of their copywriting stages, and I think that, that has to do with the fact that it's so overwhelming. There's so much to learn. I was talking to somebody today. You know, I reviewed his copy, and he's done multiple revisions of a product page, and all of them have been not very good. And I'm trying to toe that line between like being discouraging versus giving this guy some truth, which is like, you're just, listen, what you need to work on is like how to write a bullet, mm. how to write a headline. Like you need to return to fundamentals. Like, you know, you, when you pick up that violin, like you're trying to like play Paganini and like what you need to play is a friggin' C scale. It's so funny you said that because that was exactly where my head went, which was Paganini? like, Oh, exactly. You think of Caprice 24? I think of Caprice 24 all the time. I think of Mozart B minor. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even, I can't even name like an actual like symphony and just say Mozart. So <laughs> I think of Mozart and then a key. And then a key. Um, <laughs> No, like, I, I was thinking the exact same thing. Like, as soon as you said that, I was like, well, this person doesn't have the reps. And they didn't do the reps at the, they just didn't do the reps. Uh, and they're, that's what's happening now is he's getting his reps. He's yeah. getting his lumps. He's lucky to have a guy. Look, you could be so lucky to have someone tell you your writing sucks. So uh, Siraj is a guy that's been around the Copy Squad community for over two years now. We did a YouTube video together a while back, and then for whatever reason, like, I just basically talked to him about, like, his new job, finding steady work. We did a YouTube video, like, a year ago, and then I just did nothing. An hour, an hour long, like, or so conversation about it, and then it just kind of sat there and collected dust. It's on YouTube, but, like, it, like, does not do the viral thing. It, we don't re So we decided to pull clips of it so that we can move traffic to it, and I saw it again. One of the things Siraj said was like, I came into Copy Squad having written copy for a year and I was expecting like everyone was going to be so impressed and like there was, gonna, I was going to get all these nice comments and he said, everyone was so mean to me. <laughs> he was like, everyone tore my copy to shreds and that, that was like, okay, I'm going to keep at this until I get the Copy Squad stamp of approval mm -hmm. and that's the right mindset. You should be so lucky to have people around you who care about you enough to tell you your writing sucks. Mm -hmm. Like, the, and, and I have to put this, this is the line I tell all the people when I review copy. I'm not critiquing you as a human. I am critiquing the words on this page, and they are not you. This is back to the mindset thing. Your words on this page, that they're not who, they don't represent you as a human, they are just the copy. And so you have to make that separation that like, it just like when you, if you can't, if you can't do a three point shot and I correct you on your form, I'm not saying you're like a shitty brother. Like, I'm just saying like, you know, you're a terrible son. Uh, no, it means I'm correct. <laughs> Bring your elbow in, like maybe get a little more bend in your knees, like stuff like that has nothing to do with you as a human. So, you should be so lucky that someone will be like, I take enough interest in you as a person that I would tell you your writing sucks. That's how you got to see it is that they like you so much that they wasted their time. <laughs> wasted. They spent their time to, to deliver that news to you and try to help you through it. I think that's a really important hurdle for a mentality game that you have to be able to go through. You have to seek that out because that's a person... That's like if you're in a friend group where when something really rocky happens or you're going through a tough time and all your friends say, man, that's tough. I don't know what to tell you. And none of them try to level. And, and some of them are like, well, I didn't want to give you advice because I thought you wouldn't like it or it, you, got, you get mad. It's like, 
man, that's you just you probably wanted something out of them. You probably wanted some feedback, some guidance, some help. Like, and so you, a, a copy chief or a mentor in copy is is like <laughs> better than your best friends. But it is like they're they're taking time and it costs them money and t- like time is money. Like they could have been mentoring someone else. They could have been working on their own stuff. So if anyone who takes the time to tell you your writing sucks, like uh, what a lucky blessing it would be. I mean, I'll tell the story. I told it on the last time we got together. Evaldo got my first piece of copy, my first draft. He didn't tell me in Florida. He said he'd be in Baltimore. So I fly to Baltimore to get this news. I walk into Doug Hill's office, all these glass walls, and Evaldo's sitting there in this little chair. And he spins around in a little chair, and he looks at me and goes, what do you think this, what do you rate yourself 1 to 10 as a copywriter? And I say, Five is average, statistically, and I'm not really good, so I'd probably say a three, maybe a two. And he said, okay, okay. I said, why? And he said, because this is the worst piece of copy I have ever read. And he he had redlined, like, the whole 26 pages of the promo. Uh So, but that was, like, I wouldn't be able to do what I do today if I didn't have someone who took the time and energy to rip my shit to shreds in that way and so that was like the greatest blessing the greatest gift that a beginner copywriter in my shoes could have had so I'd say that to all the beginners like do not let I, I've been really blessed I've never had a guy really push back on my feedback I've never really had a guy be like F- you Most guys like, thank you very much. Like, I appreciate you taking the time. Most people are very gracious about it. Sometimes I can be really harsh because if copy is exceptionally bad that it hurts my brain, I can get frustrated. So, um, but if if you're one of those people who gets triggered or egoic, like, like the 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 person who takes the time to read your, it's a fucking grueling task. Like, reading is not fun in general. Like, it's it takes effort, and if your copy's bad, it takes more effort. All right, I, it takes me about an uh, hour to review 14 pages of solid copy line by line. I've figured this out over like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of promos. It takes me about an hour to about 14 pages of copy. If your copy sucks, I can know this because sometimes it'll take me like an hour to get through six or seven pages. Because I'm sitting there typing in the comments like, here's all the fundamentals you missed. And I'll realize like, like that's grueling. Like that's draining. Like an hour of that is f- it. Like I'm like spent. Like mm-hmm. I don't. I can't like work the rest of the day. And most people don't understand the tax that that takes. So I, you got to appreciate anyone. And I, I'm, I guess I'm speaking exclusively to this folks. This this guy writing the product page. Like you're very lucky that Sean would <laughs> persist through several revisions of poor copy uh, to help you get better. And I, I'm sure he recognizes that because you, you don't usually uh, uh, attract or tolerate, you know, bad souls. Yeah, it, one of the earliest lessons that I got in my career, and this is from Mark Ford, is the power of I stopped reading here, mm-hmm. and the reason why I stopped reading here is such a profound and powerful comment to receive on a piece of copy you wrote is because a reader, a real life reader out there in the world thinking about buying your product would not have gotten that far. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody tells you that they didn't get that far, like it doesn't matter what follows from it because you need to change everything anyway. Because if that those first pieces didn't work, like, and the person provides feedback for why they didn't work, like why they stopped reading there. Well, you don't just need to change those bits and then change what follows. Like you need to completely rethink your entire approach because a piece of copy is not a modular system. You can't just like edit the first three pages and then leave the rest of it alone. You have to change the whole thing. You have to start from blank page and really reapproach how you do something like of course there are exceptions to this in the revision process but for most people if you get feedback like i stopped reading here 
you know, that tells you that you need to completely rethink your entire approach to this project. Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of people getting out there into the world have never really gotten that kind of feedback. It's tough. It's really hard to hear because, and this is the analogy that I like to use is, you know, when you're a writer, you're close to it. You associate the words in your mind with your identity, but a piece of copy needs to exist independent of you. And so it's better to adopt the mindset of a table maker. And listen, if you are making a table and it's lopsided and it's like rough and it's like uneven and sort of like non-Euclidean in some weird way. And like, if you'd like tilt it in a certain direction, it's going to like either raise Hellraiser or some like Eldritch horror. Like <laughs> you can look at a table and be like, that table freaking sucks. Mm. But it might've been the best of your abilities in the new skill of table making that you've started learning. But if a client says, hey, that table sucks, you're not going to look at the table and be like, you're wrong. It's a great table. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just obvious. The only difference between a table making process and copy is that for a lot of newbies, they can't look at a piece of copy and see how lopsided and rough and uneven and uh, like how bad your beveling is and <laughs> you know things like that and so like part of the skill of copywriting is also learning how to like look at your own work and assess like mm, that table is a little slanted and you know maybe i can fix it this way and this just goes back to how copywriting is a craft and how we have to approach it as a craft just like table making is a craft or any sort of carpentry really mm, that's a really good way to put it because like the table like the way that you describe it like you it's objectively bad because you can tell, like, you could lay a leveling tool on it and be like, this table sucks. Yeah. That's, that's the way you have to, like, view your copy chief's feedback, is they are a leveling tool. They have the sophistication, and they were built to figure this out. The, the, the one caveat, which adds a massive wrinkle to that argument, is a lot of copy chiefs. This is something that I pride myself in. A lot of copy chiefs, are great copywriters who were promoted. Yeah. And that means they actually never really learned... How to teach. Yeah, or their system or what makes... Why they do what they do. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like if you were a really charming person. You're a really charming person and you charm the pants off of everybody and everybody loves you so much. You should be a life coach. <laughs> right? Like, well, you charm everybody. So you should obviously teach everyone how to be very charming and successful. And the charming person's kind of like, I don't, I just am. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. We even saw a little bit of that at the uh, copy legends, didn't we? When someone was like, hey, how do you do this? And it's like, what do you mean how do I do this? You just do it. That was a response. Well, that was Chris Haddad. And we were talking specifically about empathy and writing emotionally. And Chris Adad was just like, what are you talking about? You look inward. You just be a fucking human being. And get, listen, most copywriters like that are out there right now learning copywriting, they haven't figured out their ha their ass from a hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. Like they, they haven't figured out what it means to be a human being yet. Mm -hmm. Most of them are 16 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd heard a copy when I was 16 years old. Yeah, me too. But I mean, so I actually started writing for money when I was around 16 years old, but I was doing like blogging and content writing and stuff like that. Damn. So I've been doing, I've been writing for money for 22 years. Damn. Um, the interesting thing about copywriting was, you know, I had been doing that for 15 years when I first started learning copywriting and I had been a professor of rhetoric, like actual argumentation for seven years before. And I feel like, when I was learning copywriting, I had to learn how to write all over again. Mm. It's a completely different type of writing. It's a language. It's, it's a language. I, I would call it a register. Um, the same way that, like, it, the way that we are speaking is not the way that we would speak, for example, to a bank teller. Mm. You know, you adopt different registers and you switch constantly between different registers depending upon the context of what you're talking about or whom you're talking to. Mm -hmm. And... 
copy is a completely alien register to most people. Yeah. Because it, it has all of its own subtexts and codes and all that. It reminds me, it's, it's much like small talk. So there are, so for instance, like your barber or a hairstylist can just, everyone that comes and sits in their chair, they can somehow strike up a conversation and you guys can, if you go to the same person for a long time, you eventually start to develop a rapport and you guys can just talk. And your conversations are like 30 minutes to an hour. And like this person does this all day with everybody that comes in here. And it is a skill. Being able to just pick up, I see you once a week, once a month, once every two months, something like that, and just pick up, and be like, how are things? And they're able to just somehow navigate that where there's not any awkwardness and it's all light and it's like a good experience. That's like a skill you got to learn on top of cutting hair, um, on top of doing nails or makeup. I don't know if those girls talk to you or not, but like uh, it, do. it does come to you when you get your nails done, she talks to you. Yeah. Okay. My toenails in particular. Mm. Okay. So uh, it, 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 it falls in that whole category. It goes with, uh, I mean, I'm, I have to make a classic, at least my token Kyle dating reference, flirting at bars is its own register. Like having that ability to walk up to strangers and just like uh, spark uh, some sort of flirtatious or attraction or anything like that is its own like sub niche of the English language, it's its own language. Like the things that you talk about, like you say at the bank teller, at the at the barber, at the bar, on copy. At copy, you come to the page with this energy and this intensity and this excitement mm -hmm. of like, oh my god, I've got the best thing ever. I got one of the greater things ever. I, I have, can't say I have best. One of the best things ever. One of the best things ever. I have something so <laughs> amazing, something so spectacular. I've noticed that my writers have started adopting the word amazing because I say it a lot. I use it as like an, like, how, <laughs> it's like, uh, let me think of anything like, hey, here's your diet soda. Amazing. <laughs> like, amazing. It's ah, so great. So amazing. Best thing ever. My, my word that I overuse in copy and in life is delightful. Yeah, I've heard that. And I, I, I got that from my friend Khalil. And I just love calling things delightful because it's such a, a unique word and people don't use it very often. And it's so, it is delightful. <laughs> that thing, that thing that you're talking, it, it is, delightful is a delightful word. When, when you were FaceTiming Mrs. Sean, when we were at uh, Copy Legends, mm -hmm. It, it rubbed off on her because you guys were FaceTiming and she was like, that's delightful. And I was like, oh God. And like now it's like, it's like delightful exponented to the delightful squared. Yeah. It's delightful overload. It's too, it's too much delightful. It's just... Too much delightfulness. It's the lovely, as a matter of fact. Uh, <laughs> oh no. Can we, how do we end on a high note? Oh, can't end on that. <sighs> what do we do now? I, I think that this is a good opportunity for you, one, to make a plug, but also really to drive home and communicate what you've been trying to communicate, mainly about mindset, and mainly about reducing things to simpler components. Because I think that that's a very valuable lesson that you, unlike many other copywriters I talk to, that you have to communicate and that you uniquely have experience in contending with. Because a lot of copywriters don't really talk about or think about mindset or the mental game of this very often, but it's still something that every copywriter has to contend with. I would, if I could, without repeating myself, right, without saying exactly so, it's an abundance mindset. And I got this at Wealth Press. And there was pros and cons to being asked to write a new launch every week. I had a team of like 13 writers. So that way we could stack enough launches ahead of time and I had to achieve all of them and make sure they were up to snuff and they were good enough. I was working with people in different countries and area codes and trying to keep everything together and it was chaotic. It it had its rewards monetarily primarily. Um but it's something that I <clears throat> eventually began very comfortable with, well, maybe this one won't work. And 
I'm trying to think of like, how do I do this without making like another dating analogy? I mean, it's just such an easy one for me to make all the time and copy is like, if you, if you say hello to one pretty girl and she says, I'm not interested or I have a boyfriend or anything like that, like, and you decide to swear off all girls forever because <laughs> that one wasn't available or didn't think you were pretty. Yeah. Right? This is what happened to me. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. <laughs> somehow this, you know, Kaylee decided to take pity on you. So, so that's, that's how all of my relationships have gone. <laughs> I'm just, I just, I'm so pathetic. Oh my God. <laughs> that women so, just pity me to <laughs> bed. <laughs> this is what our third sort of long form podcast together is always a delightful experience. It's delightful. Delightful. Amazing. <laughs> Kyle, thank you very much. And thank you everybody for watching. If you are interested in more copy that, make sure to check out the other videos on the YouTube. We have lots of free courses. We have lots of information available. Um, and if you like our stuff and want to go a little bit deeper than what is actually able to scale on YouTube a little bit, uh, we have patreon.com slash the copy that show where we go into more niche topics that might be of help to you.